Hey, thanks for checking out the Nikhil Hogan Show. If you like the content, you can subscribe to it on most major podcast platforms, YouTube or Facebook. I'm also writing a book on music education called Why Children Quit Music. And you can check out my website, NikhilHogan.com, for updates on when it's going to be released. If you're a parent who's interested in learning how best to help your children learn music, you can check out my company, SongbirdMusicAcademy.com. And there are a ton of free articles links and resources for Neapolitan Partimento-based learning, and also the Barry Harris Method if you're interested in learning jazz. Now, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Nikhil Hogan Show, the show bringing you in-depth conversations with the best musicians in the world. So happy to introduce my guest today, pianist, music theorist, and improviser, Professor Karst de Jong. Karst de Jong studied classical piano and music theory at the Royal Conservatory of The Hague. In 1991, he was appointed as Professor of Music Theoretical Subjects at the Conservatory of Amsterdam and the Royal Conservatory of The Hague. He specialized in piano improvisation and the relation between analysis and interpretation of the piano literature. Since 2003, he has been appointed Professor of Improvisation and Composition Techniques at the ESMUC in Barcelona. He regularly gives concerts with classical and jazz improvisations, both as a soloist and with with different instrumental combinations. He's the co-founder and board member of the Dutch-Belgian Society of Music Theory and was an editor for the Dutch Journal of Music Theory. He's also taught many master classes of improvisation at internationally renowned festivals. As an educator, he was closely involved in two important European Erasmus strategic partnerships, METRIC, which deals with improvisation in the curricula of higher music education in Europe, and NAIP, the European Master of New Audiences, and innovative practices. He released two CDs with solo piano improvisations, Improdisiac 1 and 2. And during this year, during the first semester of the academic year 2019 to 2020, Karst de Jong will be a visiting professor at the Yong Suto Conservatory of the National University of Singapore. Could you tell me a little bit about your musical background and how old were you when you started music? Well, I remember actually music being being in my life uh, f- forever, so to say. Um, and um, one of one of the things I remember very clearly from my from my early youth, when I was three or four years old, we used to have a player piano in the house, and I was greatly inspired by this player piano because there was a a, a big cabinet with music rolls in there. And um, I used to, uh, my mother used to help me out to, to, to get these rolls into the piano and then I used to work the pedals and hear Chopin being played live actually from that piano. I remember those experiences being really, really important. Uh, as well, my mother was from a, from a quite musical family. My grandfather was actually an organist and a, and a pianist. Uh, he died quite young. Um, but my mother uh, was clearly also very musical and she used to, uh, to have me and my twin sister on her lap and uh, and play Christmas songs and play all kinds of stuff on the piano. And I was fascinated by that from a, from a quite early age. Well, Karst, do you have absolute or perfect pitch? Uh, actually, I do, but um, it's not ruling my life. And I remember my mother always had it, and, and later it sort of came naturally to me as well. But it's not this kind of absolute pitch that um, that is really on the, on the hertz precise. I have some friends... Who, uh, who are suffering when a record, for example, goes a little too fast or too slow. But I, I actually <laughs> don't have that problem. I can, I can adapt quite easily. There's one curious thing, though. I, I, I noticed that lately uh, this perfect pitch is sometimes a half note off, mm. <laughs> which is kind of annoying. But actually, because I don't use it that actively, it's not really, it's not really in, in my way. But it's kind of strange. Let me read you a quote of yours. The quote is, As a kid, I always improvised. I remember never just practicing my lessons, but always sort of wandering off into my own world. And I realized later that I was creating a connection with the sound world with the piano, simply creating a connection, knowing that if I'm going to do this, I will hear that. And this thing I established as a kid actually without thinking very much. And my teachers also did not really pay much attention to it. So uh, is it fair to say that you were always experimenting from the beginning? Actually, yeah, that's that's actually true. Because I got relatively late um, into to official piano lessons. I think I must have been six, and definitely before that, I was just doodling around on that piano, and I, I was fascinated by that piano. And what sort of things would you improvise? 
I, I actually I actually don't really remember that so so well at least not from this very early early years but I remember uh, from later when I was about eight or nine years old I just used to to play things from, from the radio or I just used things that I liked I would try to find them on the piano and I would sort of go with that um, so that could be a really that could be really anything my father for example was a huge Bach fan my father would always on Sunday there was always the radio playing Bach so uh, I had all this kind of input and I guess that I just just took that unconsciously and, and combined things with that and it was really doodling I don't I don't even know if you can really call it improvising but it, I, I just loved running around on that piano. <laughs> Can I ask you, uh, what kind of music were you listening to growing up? Was it classical, but were there other styles involved as well? Oh, no, no, no. Many, many, many different styles. I mean, um, from the moment that I started to um, to buy records, I would say that it was really a mixture of everything. Things like the Beach Boys, for example. I was I was mesmerized by this, uh, this Smiley Smile album from the Beach Boys. Uh, having this kind of experimental uh, harmonies, um, sort of amazing stuff happening there that somehow reminded me also of the great classical music that I must have heard. But um, yeah, d d d these kind of things. Jazz came a little bit later, but I also was really, really into Bill Evans, Bruckner, Ravel, uh, Debussy. I mean, it came from everywhere, actually. Okay, so you said you had started at six years old with traditional piano lessons. And the teacher, you, you mentioned, did not really pay much attention to the improvisation and that kind of thing. So was it a very standard kind of approach to learning classical music, a memorization, playing repertoire? Yeah, I had a quite standard approach to that, I must say. I was somehow cheating a little bit because I usually used to, to learn the music I had to play from score, but then after one or once or twice I would I would just not read the score anymore. <laughs> so I was a very good sight reader. I was sort of <laughs> remembering the music and then going from there. I remember my teachers being annoyed by that because you know I would make I would play another note or something like that. And <laughs> that was just not not appreciate it. <laughs> so how many years did you have lessons? Uh, how many teachers did you have? And uh, did this lead all the way into a university? Um, no, let me see. I, I, I think if I remember well, I had a teacher from, from six until I was nine. Um, actually, there were two different teachers, but, but um, from six to nine, I had some regular piano lessons. And then um, we moved to the other side of the country. I mean, I lived in Holland, but a very small country. But anyway, we moved to the other side, so I couldn't continue my lessons with those teachers. Um, and I think that was interesting for my own development, because between mm, ages of 9 and 11, maybe 12 even, I didn't have an official piano teacher. So actually there I was just doing on the piano what I like to do. Right, right. And, and what's it like to grow up in Holland musically uh, with the live music? Did you watch much live music as well? Uh, well, you know, really, I mean, it's so long ago. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, yes, we, we, we definitely went to many concerts. Um, I, I wouldn't remember everything, every one of them, but I remember a couple that made a huge impression on me. I remember a concert of Maurizio Pollini in the, in the Concertgebouw. Uh, I, I must have been about 10 or 11 years old, so it must have been the early 70s. And uh, that, that made a huge impression on me because, first of all, I remember he played uh, Waldstein, which I had never heard before. And, and the last movement uh, was, was just getting me on another planet. And he played also Schoenberg, I think Opus 11. And, and I was just mesmerized by this, especially by the Schoenberg at that moment, at that moment uh, uh, being music that was not, I couldn't connect it to anything I, I had really heard or, or, or played. I remember that, that, for example, very well. Yeah. Now, did you uh, keep your improvising going into your teenage years? And did you actually play jazz as like uh, you study it and try to play it? No, actually, jazz came later. Jazz came later. So I was listening to Bill Evans, I would say, uh, in my in my teenage years, but I wasn't really playing jazz in that sense. In my teenage years, there was actually uh, quite interesting. I was kind of um, branching out into a lot of pop music as well. I remember being uh, again being fascinated by by pop groups like Yes and Pink Floyd and Genesis. This whole um, jazz rock, or it wasn't jazz rock, it was actually, what was it, symphonic rock, I think they called it. And um, yeah, what I was doing was, was playing from the records. 
So uh, by that time, I had a record player in my in my own room, and I was uh, was just listening a lot to this music, and I was just playing it on the piano and improvising with it. Yeah, that was also an important influence. Now, when it comes to uh, theory, like, what was your understanding of theory? Now you're a professor of theory, but as you were growing up and playing all this different music, playing the repertoire, what was your approach to, under, even when you improvised, like, what, what was going through your mind? How did you think when you were a younger man and you were improvising? Yeah, that's a very good question. I was sort of conceptualizing things. I remember that. Even as, as a kid, I remember sort of discovering the diminished chord. And I thought it was a very interesting thing because I, I remember finding out that there were only three of them. And, um, and also that when you move from one diminished chord to another diminished chord, you get a kind of eerie sensation. And for some reason, I, I called this chord the water chord. I think I thought it was kind of very fluent. Uh, so that, that kind of, you know what I mean? I sort of my own concept on there. But I didn't theorize that much, actually, in that time. I was also not really aware of uh, what kind of scales I was playing. But I was, I was picking up materials f from, from the pieces that I liked and that I was inspired by. I remember being fascinated also by, um, by Debussy's Children's Corner. That, that really has kept me busy for two, three years when I was in my early teens. How did you study uh, music theory and wh how did you start to integrate that into your... So I assume you did a pretty conventional... Did you do a conventional theory course? What was your training like in your undergraduate and then your master's and then your... Doc your yeah, I actually... Uh, before I came to the conservatory, I didn't do any theory at all. I didn't do any solfege. Um, I sort of um, learned, as you said in your quote, I sort of learned solfege, I would say, from the piano. I, I was uh, at some point so sure that if I would, would uh, play a certain or, or move, move my hand in a certain way, I would hear something. I knew already what I was going to hear. So I think I kind of built up my, my, um, my solfege with the instrument rather than with, uh, with singing practice. So when I came to the conservatory, I just at a very regular age, I think I went there when I was 19. Uh, when I came there at the entrance exam, I, I remember thinking like, uh, wh why, why do I have to, you know, why do they ask me to sing this from, from a school? I mean, <laughs> right. it's what it is, right? I mean, for me, there was not really a distance between between that I, uh, where I saw other people struggle I thought like why <laughs> I, it, yeah, it just didn't make sense to me so I started start, I started off at the conservatory with, with a quite um, a regular piano uh, major but as I went actually already in the first year I was I was strangely fascinated by music theory and that also maybe connects to other things in my life where I was interested in electronics I was interested in mathematics I was interested in, in, in just how things work. So I had a fantastic theory teacher in the first year uh, of my studies in The Hague. And she, uh, well, she noticed, first of all, that uh, I didn't need to, to train anything with my ears, but that I just needed to, to get the uh, to get concepts and get the terminology and, and to, get, to get to know what was out there. Did you agree with all the theory that you were listening to? Like how, like for instance, counterpoint and harmony are now two separate subjects in, in most universities. And so, were you do you were you enjoying the codification of these things that you would heard your whole life, or did you rebel against some of the concepts? No, actually, I was fascinated by it, and um, I realized that they were. I think it was a good thing that I realized that they were codifications, so that they were never the truth in in, in that. And I must say that there was, um, at that time in The Hague, uh, a very special team of, uh, of theory teachers, some really extraordinary uh, teachers that, that I'm, I'm grateful until this day that I have been uh, taught by them. And what do they do different? Well, I think their general approach was to teach theory as a kind of abstract behind uh, music, but not as, a, as, as the truth. So we, we learned really rigorous counterpoint, uh, but not in order to, to recreate the composition, but in order to actually understand the mechanisms. So their idea was also very strongly, and you must imagine this was in the 80s of the last century, where I think that generally also the interest for contemporary music was greater than it is today. Um, uh, they were looking for 
let's maybe say universal truths behind counterpoint that could make it transferable between uh, whether you were in medieval period or in Bach counterpoint or in Ligeti. And um, we got that very strongly there from, from, from that institution. I, I really appreciated that. This is an interesting thing that you said. You said, um, having used standard concepts and tools for many years while teaching written harmony, composition, and harmonic analysis, th this is talking about improvisation. I could not help but feel that these specific concepts were not always appropriate for teaching spontaneous harmonic invention in improvisation. I found myself regularly shouting progressions at students who would then stop playing and start calculating. There's <laughs> simply not enough time for a person to think while solving a written harmony or composition exercise while improvisation. The mind works completely differently. So can you, could you explain how does the mind work differently in improvising? And you've been thinking about this for a very long time. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, this has been a huge process also for myself. It has been until today, I think, a process of, of actually understanding how these things work. Well, maybe start with the, the example where you're shouting progressions at students. And how did you, when did that click for you? Yeah, no, when you're shouting progressions at students while they're playing, they always stop playing. So I, I, I could see that sort of the the mental activity, the thinking acti activity is, is in some way uh, an enemy of the, of the spontaneous music making. On the other hand, I realized that if you don't work on these theoretical concepts and if you don't train sort of in a way, you can also not play. Play spontaneously. So there's an interesting two sides of a coin there, um, which maybe has, has has to do with the the idea of intuition or the concept of intuition. Um, I've been thinking about that because um, intuition is very often explained as something that comes completely spontaneously, but I believe that you can actually build this intuition over time. So when you work um, uh, when you work consciously on certain concepts, uh, like for example uh, ornamentation in Chopin, when you work on that, when you when you make exercises for yourself, when you investigate, when you analyze what's happening in that music, then at some point this will become uh, a subconscious knowledge, and that subconscious knowledge can come out spontaneously while improv improvising. So I've been looking, working with students, I've been looking at how do you do this? How do you work? How, how do you can, how can you spontaneously improvise with them and at the same time work on these kind of concepts? And that is until today, it's still a challenge. You know, most classically, you know, I'm sure you deal with many talented young people who can play very difficult pieces in the repertoire, but you could actually do that without learning any theory. Isn't that true? You could, you could actually become a great technical pianist without knowing these harmonic ideas. How do you get them to start integrating understandings of theory into a practical way of improvising if they've never really thought about that? Yeah, well, actually, that's something that we have been thinking of at the Conservatory of The Hague quite intensively. And maybe it could be interesting to um, to tell you about that, because um, until 2014, we used to have a quite traditional theory program in the conservatory. And from the first European uh, intensive improvisation project, the first Erasmus project that you that you mentioned in 2012, we started to realize that actually we should do something about the way that they learn theoretical concepts. And we should try to do that with them playing. So one of the important uh, new subjects that we developed is actually called oral skills and improvisation. And this replaced the um, traditional uh, sight singing and, and dictation lessons with a lesson where we play with ensembles. So from the very first year, and this is actually a three year course from the very first um, semester, students are in ensembles for, of, of about six, seven, eight uh, large and uh, mixed instruments. And we, we work through all the concepts of scales, chords, rhythm, um, with playing, while playing, and we're trying to do uh, as much as possible in time. And this has created a, a very interesting workshop situation, you could say, where the students are um, struggling with the same question, like how can I understand certain concepts, but at the same time, keep moving, being, being in time. What do you find are the common mistakes that students do when they're, they're trying to learn how to improvise? Well, I would say that the, it starts all with the hearing. 
it starts all with uh, with the oral development. So I would say maybe you have like three stages. You have a first stage where you simply have to learn to recognize what you hear. And the speed, of course, of this recognition also has to be trained because there are students who simply they, they hear, but they cannot say what it is and they can certainly not um, reproduce it on their instrument. So this is kind of first stage. Could you give an example of that? So like what would they be trying to hear, a scale or uh, maybe a phrase or something like that? Really simple. I could play a very small melody on the piano and I could just make a call and response. So I can just tell them, OK, um, I play a few notes. And and we are in time. Huh? So, for example, three and four, and I play do 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 dum bum bum, and then they play do dum be dum bum. Now, how would they know what is the correct response? Uh, well, they simply in the beginning they simply imitate. So they just have to do exactly what I do, and they have to stay in time. Well, there you can see uh, uh, how your ears are working, how your uh, interface works of you with your instruments. Etc. Etc. Would a pianist play two hands? Uh, the pianist play one hand. It's just really solo voice. So, um, but the important thing is to stay in time. And when it's too difficult, just make it simpler. So it can really be on a, on a very very basic level. The, then the next step is actually that that you do hear what what is happening, but you simply are not fast enough on the instrument to reproduce it in time. So that that is that is more we discovered also this is actually very essential because for all those different instruments uh, there are actually different uh, difficulties. There are different problems. Uh, a harpist is, is is different from a tuba player or from from a violinist. So also for me, this has been a learning path, actually, that hey, I know how it works on a piano, but how does it work there for this cellist? Can you give an example of a challenge on a different instrument? Um, well, of course, uh, if you play something quite chromatic for a harpist, they really have to think ahead about which pedals <laughs> to when. And that's something they never do because they always practice exactly the pedals and the change of the and they know when it's going to happen and they're always on time. But if they have to do something in real time, it's a different story. The same thing for guitarists, for example. I have, I'd never realized that, but for guitarists, uh, even simple melodies can sometimes be difficult because they have to decide uh, on which strings to play them. Right. Uh, yeah, and they sort of get stuck in, this <laughs> in these possibilities. Now, now, how do you move from there? After the call and response, what happens next? Um, we go to transposition. So, um, for example, uh, we, I play I play a, a phrase. They play the whole phrase after me, and then I ask them to transpose to start on different notes, or I can ask uh, to go into different key, or uh, you, you have different ways of asking them. Or to start on this note, I play a note, but I don't say what it is. But start here, play the melody. So to sort of get them uh, get them active in um, uh, yeah in in how should, should you say maybe like disconnecting uh, the musical event from a score or disconnecting it from a, a, yeah a certain way that looks. So I want to I want them to go into the oral world. Is is that so? You're asking them to modulate or just play in a different key the same thing? Yeah, yeah, no, to just play the same thing in a different key or to play the same thing starting on a different note or to play the same thing in a key with four sharps or... Would you take something and put it in the minor if it was in the major? No, oh, that's also possible, yeah. Or even to, to, to morph it onto a, onto a whole tone scale or whatever. I mean, you, you have many, many possibilities there. Is there any implied bass to the melodic idea that you're playing? Um, not necessarily. It doesn't have to be. But we do go in the same in the same lessons. We do go to harmonic training, which is um, again uh, uh, it's it's building up very very slowly. It's building up from very simple uh, improvising over chords to improvising over pendulums. So this is like uh, a two chords, uh, alternating chords, like a one and a five, for example, and then to improvising over um, over voice leading schemata like like falling fifth sequence or uh, romanesca or, or monte sequences so things that are that are common in music and then improvising over over longer harmonic schedules maybe in a similar way as you would improvise over a jazz standard 
with string players, they don't have the ease of playing counterpoint like a pianist does. So how do they, uh, like for instance, a Romanesco, which these are partimento and gallant schema concepts. How do you get them to, th- do, you, do they imagine the bass in their head or do you play the bass for them with your left hand? Well, actually, they have to imagine it in their head, but they never do. <laughs> string players, I mean, string players really uh, uh, rarely uh, are aware of what the bass note is actually. Uh, so, so I have to confront them with that reality first, of course, by playing it on a piano. So I would really play that that Romanesca bass on the piano, and I would ask them to play very simple improvisation on it. And then the interesting thing is that in the beginning, they always hold on to the bass. So in fact, you get, it's quite sort of natural. You get in fact an improvisation with parallel octaves or with, uh, with a kind of, <laughs> what do you say, a kind of ornamented or, or dimin- diminuted uh, parallel octaves. Right, and you don't want to do, you would, do you, because you know, playing live is a little bit trickier with written counterpoint, do you, but you still make them do the rules they can't play the parallel octaves and the parallel fifths? Well, in the beginning, I'm, I'm a bit loose with it because first I want them just to move. First, I want them to just experience these things. Uh, because if we talk about the forbidden octaves and forbidden fifths, we're really talking about certain stylistic uh, things. And I'm not so sure that that is my goal. I mean, of course, if they want to become uh, uh, great improvisers in a Baroque style, they will have to be confronted with that, with those kind of rules. But if not, um, I, I, I rather have that they can imagine these chord progressions that they can, and, and, and then do with it what they want. As a teacher, what advice can you give to other teachers who want to run an, an improvisational ensemble? What's the fastest, most effective way to think to get things going? <laughs> oh, that's that's a really hard one. I should maybe tell you something about my experiences in this uh, impro intensive, this European project, because that has been an eye opener for me as well. Which is that if you improvise together uh, again, and if you have to think too much, um, it becomes impossible. So the more rules you have, the more difficult it actually is to spontaneously improvise. And what was very interesting for me, at least my personal uh, development also in the in those um, two uh, European projects, is that we had some colleagues uh, that are completely into free improvisation. So they would never even play a chord. They are completely free. For example, my fantastic colleague from, from Barcelona, Agustin Hernandez, an amazing player, but um, uh, it's it's not about chords, and it's not even about uh, rhythmic pulse. It's really about um, <laughs> they are very strict, actually, in many things in how you respond to each other, how you listen, how you um, how you decide your position in in the musical texture. Um, but basically, what you do is is spontaneous playing what you think is right at that moment. And um, I discovered that that is actually a quite good way to start with students before you go into the chordal stuff. Now you mentioned there are a lot of rules if you do try to get into, like, for instance, improvisation in an ensemble. So, like, for instance, if you had a one-hour class, what would you do in one hour? Would you try and cram a lot of things in or would you do one thing very well over an hour? Well, this this really depends. Um, if it is a workshop, sometimes I try to cram a couple of things in. Because then I think, you know, I'm not coming back and you should take away something right. from here. But if I, but if I have a regular class, uh, for example, this, this um, subject I, I, I mentioned, this oral skills and improvisation, it runs for three years. And uh, the first two years, we're really working on, on, on these concepts and on tonality and rhythm and pulse, etc. But the third year, we have decided to actually let go a little bit more and to see what also comes out of those students. So um, what interest is there? So I could, I could easily work for two hours on just one concept or one idea. Or, um, can you give can- an example of just like taking a group of kids and working on one idea? Yeah, well, one, one thing I like to do is, uh, is, is a little game of uh, rules, restrictions. Uh, and um, uh, th- th- this simply means like, okay, we have all this material. We are basically able to do anything we want. But let's decide on an improvisation and let's set ourselves some rules before we start and let's set ourselves some restrictions. So a very simple one can be to say, okay, uh, we only play in a – two flat key. Uh, so that could be B flat major, that could be G minor, but it could also be any kind of modal 
uh, C Dorian. Just I call this a two flat key. So you're restricted to those seven notes, and for the rest you can do anything you like. And then we we play. And what is also very important is after playing, you make a little evaluation. You know what happened? Okay, did we like that? Um, uh, how we're we responding to each other? What kind of role did we take? Why did we all play all the time? Why wasn't there a little bit more air in there, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you sort of set yourself a, a, a limit, and with that, you can actually zoom in on, on things that are happening. And I think that's a very nice way of working. Now, you have developed a new approach to tonal improvisation that uses arrows to navigate through harmony with fundamental bass progressions and patterns of functional modes. Could you talk about that, like how you came up with that, and well, what's your goal with this new system? Oh wow! Yeah, that's um, that's a big one, actually. Y- yeah, I have. I mean, I must go back to uh, 2006 when I met in Barcelona. I met a colleague, a German colleague, a very dear friend of mine, Thomas Noll, and he is a mathematical music theorician. And uh, I was at that time. Uh, um, I was not that long a professor in in Barcelona. That was only for two years or so when I met him, and. Um, what happened for me in Barcelona was that I, for the first time, I was teaching improvisation to ensembles. And I was actually struggling finding a way of um, being free with harmony. And I was working, I mean, I didn't know anything about Partimento yet, but I did sort of feel that 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 there were uh, harmonic progressions that are very logical and that feel very normal to us and others that are actually not. Uh, so I was sort of working uh, on a set of exercises by myself that was based on the on the perfect fifth relationship between chords, which seems to make sense. I mean, we, we all know that five one is a very strong uh, so a strong thing, and also a circle of falling fists. But I was sort of of working on that, and at the same time, my colleague Thomas Noll, uh, we we got into a long conversation. He was uh, writing a paper. He was trying to find the mathematical origin. Of the um, of the major scale, which 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 seems like a maybe ridiculous question, like how would you like to to explain that with mathematics? <laughs> but he was using a kind of I don't know word theory, algebraic word theory to get there, and it was fascinating me. And from that came longer conversations, and we got into these perfect fifths, and. I still don't know until this day how it exactly happened, but we were doodling around and we were writing little arrows and um, and suddenly we sort of saw a little bit the light. <laughs> and we, yeah, it was very funny. We came uh, upon a, a graph um, from Gottfried, Gottfried Michael Weber, I think, which called the Weber space. And we made a kind of simplified, simplified Weber space which, um, uh, to, to explain it simply, it's, um, it, it has a horizontal and a vertical dimension. And the vertical dimension was the dimension of the progressions, we would call that. And we would simply say in the vertical dimension, you can only move fifths up or down. So that was uh, one thing. And the horizontal dimension, we thought of what is the strongest harmonic connection that you have apart from the perfect fifth. And we both agreed that this would be the minor third. Okay, so now why did you choose the minor third as a strong progression? Because if you think of musical connections, then the, um, the, the relative major and relative minor is, this, is the strongest connection that we actually know. So... Um, from from very early tonal music, uh, we see that that for example in a in a baroque suite form, uh, if you're in a major key, if you're in C major, you will you will modulate to G major. But if you're in the C minor key, you modulate to E flat major. So this 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 minor third is sort of a very strong connection. Is the that thing- even in the major key? So if you're in C, you go to E flat. Yeah, well, actually, if you think of a fundamental way of a fundamental progression, of course, in C major, it would be A minor. So it's the it's the same minor third, but it's the other direction. But then you go you go to E flat, though. Uh, if you go from C major to E flat, yeah, of course, this is um, uh, if you if you consider the what we call the upper structures, it would be remote. But if you consider the fundaments, it's close. So that's kind of that was kind of where where we, where we started thinking. And that was leading to a system where you have basically arrows up and down for perfect fifths and arrows left and right for minor third relationships. 
between the fundaments of the courts. And from there, we, we developed into describing basically any fundamental connection between courts with, a, with an arrow symbol. And uh, from then, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing process. I mean, we, we, we've been publishing articles about it now for 12 years, and uh, the end is not in sight. Uh, but it's, for me, a fascinating uh, thing, actually, to be, to be you know, involved in a more fundamental thinking about music. And you use this with the students, and how effective has it been? Well, that's a very that's a very good question because in the beginning I thought um, I thought uh, we found uh, we saw the light huh? and we, we we found the solution to everything, and then it turned out it wasn't that easy at all for students. <laughs> so, so um, I, I I did a whole uh, extra master's degree actually um, uh, with a thesis called um, Navigating Through Harmony, which basically uses these arrows as literally as guiding. Uh, symbols for harmonic progressions and I must say the, the 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 better students the students that are more advanced they can work with it but the beginning students uh, are completely confused <laughs> so um, it's it's been a success and and also not a success at the same time I think uh, at least when you want to apply it to improvisation so you're a professor of music theory. There are quite a few competing theories of music theory. There's functional harmony, Roman numerals, fundamental basis, Schenkerian analysis, set theory. Now we have Neapolitan Partimento, which is becoming quite popular. So how does someone learn music theory with the goal of practical improvisation and composition? How do they make sense of all these frameworks? Well, I'm using, I'm really using different, different influences. So for me, Partimento is also a very important source of inspiration. But unlike maybe many other colleagues, again, Partimento for me is a way of understanding the logic behind the, the harmony, the logic behind tonality and tonal structures. And I'm not using Partimento uh, to recreate exactly the style of the 18th century. So, so here again, but this is also a bit of a personal approach in my improvisations. I, I, when I improvise in a Bach style, so to say, I'm not trying to ha get a result that could be composed, could have been composed by Bach. I'm inspired by Bach, and I, I, I do use the, the things that he does. I try to to use his um, his ways of expressing things, uh, his harmonic tricks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I don't intend to to sound like Bach. Let's say it like that. And that's a little bit the same for me. Partimento is a very, very valuable input, and it's it really puts many things in place. Uh, and it's very useful. I mean, I've been experimenting, for example, with a, a colleague from Luzern, Christoph Baumann. We've been experimenting putting uh, partimento ideas in, into jazz. It's wonderful. I mean, it's really, it really works. But it's not partimento in the sense that we're, we're, we're sounding like an 18th century. Now, how does that also uh, change your perception of uh, more traditional harmony? Well, um, I've always felt that traditional harmony, that I, I thought I knew everything about it, but I've always felt that, that it was a bit disconnected from, from the factual uh, uh, meaning of harmony in music. And I've thought a lot about that. Um, and I think that the, both arrows and, um, and partimento have brought me closer, at least closer to a kind of musical reality of how it actually works. If a parent wanted to start their child's music journey the correct way, in your opinion, involving improvisation and composition right at the beginning, what's the best way to go about it, doing it with a young child? Mm. Okay, I think very important is simply imitating stuff that you hear. So uh, if, if, if a young child is lucky enough that they can have a teacher who can play around with them, who can literally make them improvise very simple structures. They could use Partimento for that. I think it's wonderful uh, for, for young children. Again, but I would, uh, I would stress always the playfulness. So, so I would not stress that it is um, stylistically accurate or something like that, because I'm not sure if a, if a kid nowadays really benefits from that. So I think I think the playfulness is extremely important, um, and at the same time, just just thinking of my own background, at the same time, don't um, don't get away completely from the literature because there is so much great inspiring music out there. So I think for a kid, it's really important to have a mix between real good music. Um, so 
I don't believe in any kind of piano method that has been written uh, to get the fingers going. I think you, you can straight away go into into nice little pieces that are not too difficult from uh, from uh, piano Buch, or the clavier Buchlein, for example, um, or, or Bach inventions. Go to real music, and on the other hand, play around with the material, even on the very simplest level. Generally speaking, when a kid learns a piece, they just memorize it, they play it, they don't think too deeply about it. But how would should uh, somebody look at a piece that they've played and break it down and play around with it? Well, you can start by, by making variations. I mean, I remember myself doing that. Actually, uh, one of those um, uh, great pieces in the clavier, you can, uh, what is it like? <laughs> that, that kind of, uh, uh, with a kind of boudon in the bass. You you can you can let a kid play that piece and it's very fun to play that, and then you can say let's just improvise on this on this on this um, boudon thing on this pedal point and let's just go and let's do our own thing on it and then go back to the piece again. So out and in. When you think about late romantic music of like Mahler and Strauss, would you think of that more in with German harmonic frameworks or would you think of that? With, a, with your new understanding of harmony? Actually, I think of that with my new understanding more, more than with Partimento and more, or more than with the, the Roman numerals. Yeah. Uh, and also, I would, would, would I think that is the, the good thing about Partimento. You could still use the Partimento approach in the 19th century style um, when you're not too strict. When you think about the, the, the underlying logic, which is basically the logic of the voice leading combined uh, combined with the with the fundamental lo- logic, then you can come quite far. Now, I wanted to ask you about materials. Let's say you're not you're not lucky enough to be studying with you in the Hague. Uh, you're somewhere in another part of the world, and but you still want to learn about improvisation. You want to learn what are some books they can buy, materials, links, resources. What can they use online to start this journey? Oh, that's a very good question, uh, because there is not that much out there. And as you probably also know from your own experience, uh, to improvise out of a book is something uh, <laughs> of, a, <laughs> of a paradox. <laughs> I mean, something impossible. I mean, I've, I've actually had a couple of times in my life that I tried to write the book on improvisation, and I always stopped with it because I thought this cannot go in a book. So maybe what I would recommend them is to go to the website of our metric project, which is uh, metric.eu or metricimpro.eu actually. And that's maybe the closest that we have come so far creating a, a resource for, for how actually to teach and learn improvisation. And maybe I can explain a little bit because this metric project <clears throat> was the second of those um, two uh, big European uh, Erasmus strategic partnerships. And we had 14 institutions in there uh, very interesting schools. I mean, uh, very high-level schools. There was the Sibelius Academy. There was uh, Conservatoire National Supérieur de Paris. Esmouk Barcelona. Guildhall was in there. David Dolan, you have uh, recently spoken to. Um, so, so an incredibly interesting network. And what we have done is actually to to document uh, part of our our working practices in in videos, four or five minute long videos. And those videos are all are all available actually for free on that website. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, of course, I'm I'm making publicity for myself, but but to be honest, I think it's one of the one of the good resources that's there. There's a cool video of you on YouTube playing. I believe it's called uh, YST Concert Classified, and you play you play three jazz standards, but you arrange them to sound like virtuosic classical pieces. And I think I heard uh, all the things you are: autumn leaves, round midnight. Now, could you explain to me and the audience, technically and musically, what you were doing in those pieces? Mm, that's that's very <coughs> that's very uh, very right. Yeah, um, actually. It's just, I mean, these jazz standards inspire me. But again, I'm not a jazz pianist. I'm not a typical jazz pianist. I mean, I can play jazz. But I feel that, again, there is a, there is a musical message in those pieces and in those themes. They are great themes. And again, they inspire me. So what I do is I call these classified. Uh, obviously, um, instead of jazzing something up, uh, I classify something. <laughs> uh, and, and on purpose, I'm not thinking at all what I'm going to do before I play. So uh, Oh, so I, those performances are completely improvised then? 
Absolutely, 100%. So uh, the only thing that was not completely improvised was the beginning of All the Things You Are, because I recorded that, uh, that was the first time, on my first CD I recorded a version of that, all, uh, called All the Things You Were, and actually I, I sort of took the same beginning, which is a bit Brahms-inspired, but after that, I never make any decisions. And this is for me, the, for me the, um, the challenge, actually, to be on stage, to have the audience there and to, to, yeah, to just have the guts to let it happen. Do you, still, do you still maintain the basso continual bass, right, going and then you try and figure out how you want to color the top part? Uh, maybe something like that. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a real-time decision. So you, you could maybe compare it to that. It's maybe a sort of... Real time party mento, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then at the same time, uh, nothing has been decided beforehand, and that at the same time, uh, do you have to maintain some of the harmony, the, some of the jazz harmony? Yeah, actually, actually, I, in a, in a sense, I have to maintain it. <clears throat> I must say that jazz harmony, as such, is actually nothing different from baroque or classical harmony. Uh, people sometimes think that. But, uh, but that's a misconception. And that has been co- become even more clear to me when I was working on this Arrows project. Because when you really focus on the fundamental connection of chords, you see that the only difference is in the upper structure and not so much in the logic of the progression of the fundaments, to say it this way. Uh, so, um, and, and obviously a, a piece like All the Things You Are is, is built on, on, on falling fifth circles. Uh, it, it, it's very cleverly uh, more interesting in the sense in the, than um, uh, Autumn Leaves because it's actually modulating but using this, this jumping from one circle to another, as I say, as I call it. Now, you've been listening to Bach your whole life with, due, due to your father. So when you took a piece like Autumn Leaves, I could hear, I could hear those influences. Now, what, let's, let me ask you the, the question of, of um, if you want to make something sound like Bach, how, is, how does your mind think? Ah, wow. Actually, I don't think too much. I mean, I sort of tune in to the feeling of Bach, if, if, you, if you see what I mean. Maybe similar as that you change the radio station. You, you, you sort of attune to the, to the feeling and to the, you know, to, 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 to the way it If sounds. you could explain to the audience technically... Um, if it's possible, like what kind of ideas uh, that you commonly use? Yeah, um, <laughs> these are actually, I mean, that's the interesting thing. These are actually quite common devices. So uh, the, the, you, have, and you have always certain paths that lead you from one place to the other. Uh, so if I'm in C and I want to modulate to G, I actually do always exactly the same thing. I mean, the, the, the path is, uh, if I say it in arrows, the path is a left down down. Uh, or in other words, uh, the C is connected to the A um, uh, in a minor third relationship, and the A is two falling fifths away from the G. So you have, you have sort of always the same way of doing things. You could play there a different uh, counterpoint in the bass, or you could play the bass literally on the fundaments of those chords. Or you could uh, suggest it with the upper structures. I mean, there are many, 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 many different ways. But they, those kind of patterns, they they become ingrained, I would say, in, uh, in 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 your system. Is counterpoint the basis of his, of it all? Yes. How? What's the best way to learn counterpoint? Because there actually are quite a few ways. Hmm. The best way is really to have a good teacher. Um, who who will uh, who will guide you? I mean, I think the way that I learned was very traditional, uh, Fuchs style, you know, like uh, species, uh, starting with uh, Cantus firmus and one 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 to one or a free line against his Cantus firmus to to build it up quite abstractly. I think is quite good. So again, not to stress the style, not to say is this Josquin or is it um, uh, or whatever other composer, uh, but but to actually really go from a kind of abstract uh, exploration of how two voices move together. Is there a way to? Can you mention getting a good teacher? Now this might be a tough question, but do you know? Can you recommend? counterpoint instruction perhaps books or teachers or or what if somebody just can't go to a university is there a way to learn counterpoint well i i really like the books that peter schubert wrote for example 
but there are also more practical, more concise ones like Kent Cannon. Um, I really enjoyed reading the the, the Jeppesen book on counterpoint. Um, but but yeah, more modern. I think I would I would I would probably recommend Peter Schubert. Let's talk about music education now, and you've really been involved with that with Metric, and uh, this is done in higher education, improvisation. Are you interested uh, in moving this somewhere into kind of, I would say, lower education, like uh, the primary schools and the and that kind of thing, and getting it even younger before that? Because most people, when they learn classical music, they take exams, and it doesn't really, improvisation doesn't really factor too much into these, these graded exams. So uh, what's, what do you think is a good way to start to shift the culture so that we can get this into not just higher education, but perhaps even earlier? I think the earlier you start, the better. Um, but I, I feel that it is not not in my power to even go there, you know, because I'm, I'm like so occupied now with the situation in higher education uh, um, that uh, that I can only hope that other people are picking this up. But I have a feeling that uh, the time is kind of right. I, I really see in the past five years, I see um there's so much more activity and so much more interest also in the topic of improvisation yeah how has it changed that you've been in this game for a while now so how has the 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 topic of improvisation changed over the last couple of decades well it has changed greatly i mean i remember still in the 90s that that uh, improvisation was was considered something that you do as an amateur or you do it maybe um between clo- or behind closed doors in your home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, certainly, I mean, I'm talking about the classical music scene. And uh, I have, um, at some point, I mean, um, I actually have been looking for, for how can we, we put anywhere improvisation in this higher education trajectory. And there was, there was no ear for it in the 90s. Uh, in the early 2000s, I, I got in touch through some some people uh, with uh, with this newly um, uh, erected school in Barcelona, Escola Superior de Música de Catalunya, and uh, to my surprise, there was one of the uh, the founders who uh, who insisted on having improvisation uh, as a, as a fixed uh, subject in the in the curriculum, and I was very enthusiastic about that. Um, and that was also a reason that I went there first as a guest teacher and later I became, um, I actually moved to Barcelona. So uh, later it really became, became my home. Um, but what, it, so I, I would say in the first decade of, of, of this century, I've seen this shift, this kind of interest coming for improvisation and also not asking questions like, what is it good for? But actually understanding that, um, that this is this, this, um, ability to spontaneously do something that is needed at the moment is actually something that musicians are going to need more and more. Do you find that um, as a performer, you've played standard repertoire, you've played improvisations. How has the audience respond to improvisation versus listening to standard repertoire? Uh, this depends. Um, I would say in generally when you play standard repertoire, it's about uh, the virtuosity and uh, the audience responds very positively, of course, when you when you when you when you are this great virtuosic and you have this huge experience and uh, ex- expression etc but i noticed that improvisation when um, when it becomes apparent uh, to them that actually something is happening right now and right there that has to be prepared audiences audiences can get extremely um, enthusiastic um, just to give an example last week i had my concert here in singapore a uh, solo concert and um, at, at some point, some, usually halfway the, the concert, I, I asked the, the audience, okay, give me some input. Tell me, what do you want to hear? What should I improvise on? Uh, so somebody said, um, yeah, Bach inventions and Star Wars. <laughs> so in the moment, I had to think of a way of, <laughs> of combining Star Wars and Bach inventions. And uh, so it became a very interesting uh, improvisation not always uh, uh, perfect of course but uh, but nice stuff happened there and the, the audience got so enthusiastic you know that I, so i could could totally see that there was this connection uh yeah this identification was oh my god what must it be to sit there do you, you know? find that the audience is forced to listen even closer when you're doing something in real time uh well forced is maybe not not the right word but i think they do yeah they just they, they just get drawn in so there's the same thing it can be really simple. Another thing I, I sometimes I said, please give me four notes. 
So I get four four random notes out of the audience. And then I will play them slowly on the piano and say, I could play it like this or I could play it like that. And then, well, I sort of developed this, this little trick because then I usually start the improvisation not with those four notes. I start some kind of intro and then I try to sort of position these four notes in a very interesting or unexpected moment and then I try to develop it. And that, that is a process, you know, that, that, that the audience, most of them are not musicians and that they're completely drawn in. They, they, they sort of see, oh, wow, how is he going to, to, get, to get away with this? I guess my final question is, what do you see the future of classical music uh, in this next century now with this improvisation? Well, I think that we have to reinvent ourselves as classical musicians because I don't really see how we can maintain this 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 tradition of playing all these like dead composers or all these notes exactly the same way over and over again. I, I just cannot imagine. I know there is still a big market for, for orchestras and there's a big market for, for classical music. But at some point, I think we have to face the face the truth and we have to go the same way as um, as maybe all the other musicians in the world are doing, which is just basically being a musician in this time and uh, not being ashamed of playing your own things, actually owning your own music is, I think, such a powerful thing. And I still see a way too big um, a gap between, let's say, a, a, a jazz ensemble or a couple of jazz musicians who are playing with all this fun and all this laughs on their faces and this spontaneous stuff that happens and uh, a string quartet that uh, that looks as if you know somebody died (laughs) (laughs) well well, the great professor karst young thank you so much for coming on the show i think you're really doing some stellar work and you're really changing the culture in a really positive way and not just in classical music but in music in general with your research and your ideas and i think you're doing a a fabulous job and do you have can you just talk about your uh, your residency here in Singapore and what other projects you have lined up for the future? Oh, yeah, well, um, uh, I improvise, so I don't have that much lined up. But the residency here in Singapore is, is a wonderful experience. Um, it actually came about uh, uh, from an invitation. It indirectly came out of one of those European projects. And I got an invitation two years ago to be a guest here for a visiting artist here for two weeks in the summer. And um, uh, one of the first projects I did in, in that residency in, that, in those two weeks was a, a very challenging project. Um, all f- new first-year students here of this school um, actually were, were grouped in, in an orchestra and they had to make their own piece in two and a half days. And that piece uh, was not allowed to be written down. So actually what came out was a, was a piece without a composer, uh, without a score and without a conductor. <laughs> and they played that. They played that for the opening of the school year. So that was for me a, a, a new experience, an, an amazing experience also, because I never thought it was possible, but it was. So um, uh, that was the that, that was the beginning. And then they asked me to come back last year also for two weeks. We again did this did this two and a half day piece, and it was uh, was a different experience, but nevertheless a great one as well. Uh, and from that came actually a request: Can you be here for for a longer time? So I had to um, to find a way of uh, of leaving my other two jobs for for a moment. And uh, I'm having a great time here now with many different projects. Fantastic. Well, the great Professor Karst Young, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I really hope you'll come back soon to talk about your work as it continues to grow. And thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. This was wonderful. And uh, I hope we can uh, we can stay in touch. I hope so, too. Thank you, Professor Karst. Bye bye. Thank you so much for listening to this interview. I'm so honored to be able to talk to all of my guests. They are the best in the business. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you shared it on social media and hit subscribe for future guests. Check out NikhilHogan.com for updates on my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music, and check out SongbirdMusicAcademy.com for free resources on how to learn music. Thanks again, and I'll see you at the next show. 